Hello again, everyone, and Happy Easter from First Presbyterian Church here in Greensboro. And welcome to our combined Sunday school classes, the Agape class and the Young Men's Bible class from First Presbyterian. I'm Lane Reidenhauer, and I thank you for joining us on this Easter morning as we gather again virtually for worship and study. Our teacher, Sandy Gravett, will be starting a new series of talks this morning, From Bondage to Covenant. Exodus and Becoming a Resurrection People. Sandy will join us in just a few moments, but first let's sing a hymn together. The obvious choice for a hymn on Easter Sunday morning, Jesus Christ is Risen Today. The earliest form of this hymn can be traced back to an anonymous Latin resurrection text from the 14th century called Surrexit Christus Hodie. Around 1708, the three Latin stanzas were translated into English and published in a book called Lyra Davidica, a collection of divine songs and hymns under the title, Jesus Christ is Risen Today. A few decades later, in 1739 to be exact, a modified version was published by Charles Wesley, one of the founders of Methodism, and he called it Hymn for Easter Day. He added the final verse that we sing today that includes a doxology, and it's this version later shortened and supplemented with the Alleluia refrain at the end of each line that's become the hymn that remains so popular today. Alleluia is from the Hebrew. Allelu means praise, and Alleluia means praise God. Because praise is a joyful act, we don't usually sing or say the word Alleluia or Hallelujah during the 40 days of Lent which is set to be a period of introspection and reflection. But this hymn on Easter Sunday morning, we're freed from that restriction and we get a whole hymn book full of hallelujahs. We actually sing it 16 times in this hymn. I'll put the words up on the screen for you and invite you to sing along with me. Jesus Christ is risen today. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Jesus Christ is risen today, Alleluia. Our triumphant holy day, Alleluia. Who did once upon the cross, Alleluia. Suffer to redeem our loss. Alleluia. Hymns of praise, then let us sing. Alleluia. Unto Christ our heavenly King. Alleluia. the cross and the grave, Alleluia, sinners to redeem and save, Alleluia. But the pains which he endured, Alleluia, our salvation have procured, Alleluia. Now above the sky he's king, Alleluia. Where the angels ever sing, Alleluia. Sing we to our God above, Alleluia. Praise eternal as God's love, Alleluia. Praise our God, ye heavenly host, Alleluia. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, 
I want to open this series, which runs from Easter to Pentecost, by saying that I understand why Easter on the Christian liturgical calendar is both a day and a season of celebration. It's not a big stretch. He is risen is not merely good news. It is the foundation for much of Christian theology. As a biblical scholar, however, I always think of that Easter morning at the tomb and the weeks that followed until the events of Pentecost somewhat differently. Part of that orientation comes from the stories themselves. They present an image that is a bit less settled and sure in terms of what is happening with the followers of Jesus after the crucifixion. The stories are more confused and mysterious. It's understandable. The writers did not have more than 2,000 years to figure out what was happening and to think about how to describe those days. Instead, from the moments after the crucifixion on through to the arrival of the Spirit on those gathered together in Jerusalem, we simply don't have too many peaks into what was happening and how the followers of Jesus were making sense of it. And why should we? What they were going through, the whiplash from the excitement of the city at Passover to the conflict with the authorities in and around the temple precinct, to the arrest, the trial, the crucifixion, an empty tomb. That's all overwhelming enough. How to make sense of he is risen or his scattered appearances here and there as a figure they sometimes recognized and sometimes didn't was a lot to understand. And they only had 50 days before they say he ascends back into heaven. It's a big ask to expect it to be ordered and rational and told in a straightforward way. We move pretty quickly from the grave into the stories of the early church and to the letters of the Apostle Paul, which are actually the first surviving documents of the early Christian movement. Another part of my somewhat different orientation about these stories comes from considering the way that the church modeled its season of Easter on the Jewish festival calendar. We think about 50 days, just as the Jews counted 50 from Pesach or Passover to Shavuot, which is also known as the Festival of Weeks or Pentecost. The first of these events, of course, is all about the liberation of the people of Israel from bondage in Egypt, beginning with the dramatic final night in that country. The last is a commemoration of the giving of the law at Sinai and the stretch in between Passover and Shavuot is all about the journey from one to the next. When the church created their model of the liturgical year, the echo of their Jewish ancestry was deliberate and thoughtful. Thus, this year, I am going to use the Exodus story from Passover night to Sinai to walk us through the time from Easter to Pentecost. It sets us on a road that I hope helps you think about the 50 days of Easter in new and insightful ways. Let me continue by setting the stage just for a minute or two more. The crucifixion of Jesus in all four Gospels is timed to Passover. If you are in Matthew, Mark, or Luke, Jesus dies on the first of the eight days that mark this commemoration. In the Gospel of John, he dies on the day of the preparation before the observation of Passover begins. But no matter what the timing, we recall that what is being remembered is the point where God acts decisively for the liberty of the people, bringing them from bondage as slaves in Egypt into freedom. 
And we also recall that it begins in blood and chaos with the slaughter of all the Egyptian firstborn. Indeed, following the carnage at midnight, the Pharaoh summons Moses and Aaron immediately. For him, the need to act is urgent. There was no waiting until the morning. Rise up and go out from among my people, both you and also the children of Israel, is the command he issues. They are further told to take their flocks and their herds with them. And as the story continues, the people of Egypt are said to encourage that movement and to do it quickly for fear of what will happen next. The Egyptians urged the people, it says, to hasten their departure from the land, for they said, we shall all be dead. When considering this story, we have to pay attention to the speed of the events. It is a deliberate reminder of something important. Many times in our lives, the most memorable events and the ones that change the course of our realities come on us in the blink of an eye. The water rising during the storm to flood levels or the forest fire bearing down on your home does not give you much time to act. You have to evacuate, oftentimes in an instant. You may be driving along without a care in the world one minute, and the next you can be in a mangled heap of metal and glass. Maybe you're having a conversation with a friend or a work colleague on an average day when you realize that your words are coming out in a jumble and your speech is slurred. You're having a stroke. It is in these kinds of circumstances that what comes next is almost always disorienting. Your life loses some of its sense of normalcy. That is also the story of the people of Israel. It was night. It was dark. They were on foot. Men, women, children, flocks, herds, generations of people out in the middle of nowhere. They carried what they could manage, including one thing that is detailed in a memorable way. Mixing bowls with dough that was not yet risen were wrapped up in cloaks and slung around their shoulders as they headed into the wilderness. That wilderness, by the way, is a symbol for the unknown. You have to imagine that they are a bit shell-shocked. Everything they have known was upended, and I do mean everything. The writer adds another important detail, and although it's been both historically and literarily questioned, I want to call your attention to it. The time that the Israelites had lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of 430 years, on that very day, all the companies of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. I want to say clearly that no one can figure out why this number was chosen. Most interpreters see it as a symbolic reference and how to read that symbol has elicited much conversation across generations. It's not a rabbit hole I'm going to go down today, but I want you to be aware of it. What I want to say is that given this figure, you have to remember we're not talking about a generation or two for the years that were spent in Egypt by this people. The writer is reminding us that none of the ones that night could remember any time when they or their families, parents or grandparents or great-great-great-grandparents did not live in that place. No one could remember being anything other than labor for the Egyptians and the Egyptians having control. However harsh and forbidding it might have been, Egypt was the only home that they had ever known. Being a slave was not an identity anybody wanted. They cried out regularly for relief, but it was the only 
identity they had ever known. Desiring liberation, envisioning it, longing for it was one thing, but moving on the way to it, living through that movement was something else altogether. They probably didn't foresee being in the middle of the wilderness with people of all ages and no real shelter. They did not likely imagine carrying everything that they owned on their backs. And they might not have been aware of another little nugget the writer tucks into these verses. And indeed, provisions they had not made for themselves. In short, being in Egypt was not a good situation. They wanted freedom, but the prospect of wandering in a desert with very little that you could call your own and going hungry was a real and a present threat. If I had to sum it up in three words, I would choose these three. Tired, disoriented, scared. It was an emotional moment, but celebratory or jubilant was not the first reaction. I think of these feelings when I envision Mary and the other women going to the tomb that Sunday morning. The way the writer of the Gospel of Mark tells the story. At the close of the Sabbath, the women had gone and made a purchase of spices, preparing to do what they had not had time to do the previous afternoon, to anoint the body of Jesus for burial. It was a custom they were determined to keep for a person they loved. It was not going to be an easy task. Think about it. They had watched him die, and now they were getting ready to relive that horror because the marks of the torture inflicted on Jesus' body would be there. They had to be ready to see it all again. But still, doing this act was part of how they grieved. When I'm thinking about the feelings that morning when they're on their way, I think of C.S. Lewis's words about grief. He writes, No one ever told me that grief felt so like fear. I am not afraid, but the sensation is like being afraid. The same fluttering in the stomach, the same restlessness, the yawning. I keep on swallowing. At other times, it feels like being mildly drunk or concussed. There is sort of an invisible blanket between the world and me. I find it hard to take in what anyone says, or perhaps hard to want to take it in. Hone in here first on how Lewis talks about grief as edgy, unable to settle down, and consider how the story here says that the women went to their task exceedingly early on the first day of the week. As soon as there was enough light to walk, they headed out. As they arrived at the tomb, the sun had risen. There's an anxiousness in that timing, a need to get up and get moving, to give yourself something to do. The writer also tells us that they were fretful along the way, worried about getting access to the tomb. Who was going to roll away that heavy stone at the entrance for them? But when they arrived, there was no stone at the door. Even more, there was no body. But there was a young man sitting inside, telling them Jesus was not there. He had risen. Now go back to C.S. Lewis. Grief, he said, can make you feel mildly drunk or concussed in a way that makes it hard to take in what anyone is saying, resistant even to taking anything in that someone's trying to communicate. Go back, too, to people having left their homes in the middle of the night with only what they could carry on their backs. 
And that would be a situation. It would be hard to take in what was happening to you. Thus, at this tomb, we get two descriptive words and three actions in a sentence describing how the women responded to he is risen. Go tell the disciples he will see you in Galilee, just like he told you. And every one of these terms is telling. Here's the verse, Mark 16, 8. The first verb I want to call your attention to is this one. It means they fled or even escaped. Whatever was happening in that place, it wasn't where the women wanted to be for one second more. It's a verb about seeking safety, to get away from something that's not good. Every one of us understands the feeling. It's the innate fight or flight instinct kicking in when we feel in danger or when we experience something we have no clue how to process. These women chose flight. Overmatched by the moment, they sought distance from that tomb. And what was happening there? Nobody, not dead. But they'd seen him die. They had spices for the body. It didn't make sense to them. And thus, you get a second verb. This one, echo. It's a verb that means to have or to possess. But we're not talking about what these women had in their possession, but rather it's referring to what had a hold on them. And thus our two descriptors, tromos or trembling and ecstasis, which indicates a kind of bewilderment or astonishment. The picture here to put in your mind is as if they were overtaken by a feeling of shakiness, a shakiness connected to being bewildered, unable to make sense of what was happening. Remember they were on edge even before their encounter with this young man, but now all of us can identify with this feeling, I imagine, because everybody at some point has had an experience that completely launched them out of any frame of reference to help you categorize it. And they did what is common for humans to do when we find ourselves in this circumstance. We react physically. Our bodies tell us that something is happening and we feel um, upended by it. Thus we get to the final verb, phobeo. It's a verb that means they were afraid. But this verb and this circumstance could just as easily read that they were terrified. Who could blame them? I'm going to go back to those folks out in the middle of the desert, launched from their homes. Terrified would likely be a good word there, too, would it not? And thus, this original ending of the Gospel of Mark, and this is where the Gospel originally closed, is stark. It's not the most auspicious start to the story of the resurrection, but it is a completely human beginning. They ran away, scared and trembling, without words, because they were terrified. We live in times where we expect people always to have words. I think of the recent mass shootings at the supermarket in Boulder, Colorado. News crews were talking to people live on television moments after they had escaped with their lives. We often see a camera in the face of someone as they're sifting through the remnants of their home, destroyed by a tornado, destroyed by a fire, expecting someone to be willing to speak, to be able to speak about their loss. We often push people to articulate what they're feeling after they've lost someone close so that we can help them give appropriate tribute. And we encourage them to get back to the routine, 
not realizing that having words and feeling routine is a long way off for them. At these moments, when people are in a wilderness, having lost or having left behind something, and they are on their way to the new, where they're going is uncertain, and words may fail. You may, I expect, object to my equation of difficult and even tragic moments in our lives with times of liberation. No more slavery, no more fear of the grave. Isn't that celebratory and not something to be afraid of? And yes, you're right. There is rightfully celebration in leaving Egypt. There is rightly celebration and he is risen. But today, I want to also allow us the prospect of allowing for disorientation, for confusion, and for fear. He is risen? It reminds me of one of my favorite poems, which I know that I've shared with you, at least in part, before. It is by Wendell Berry. And to my mind, it pretty much sums up the first night of freedom for the people of Israel and the first morning of resurrection at that tomb. It is called our real work. And I see it as a guide for people on the road to living liberation, on the road to becoming resurrection people. Barry writes, It may be that when we no longer know what to do, we have come to our real work and that when we no longer know which way to go, we have come to our real journey. The mind that is not baffled is not employed. The impeded stream is the one that sings. I love Easter, but I prefer a less certain Easter morning. The angel at the tomb may understand why Jesus is not there and declares he is risen. But death is all we have ever known as humans. Thus, it may take us a bit more time in the wilderness, in the unknown, tired, disoriented, and scared to work our minds around the idea. And the story in the text tells us it's okay to take that time. Happy Easter to all of you, and I look forward to talking with you next week.